I've been asked to uh, discuss with you how do I personally approach treating patients who've become daratumor refractory with their initial treatment as part of their upfront treatment when they then relapse and we're making con we're considering second line options. Um, I think obviously the advent of quadruplet therapy upfront has been revolutionary. Uh, as we've seen, the advent of immunotherapy makes such uh, inroads into um, the BCMA targeting space. GPRC5D, FCRH5, and so on. I think what's the other major excitement to me and the major advance has been the real impact of the quadruplet therapies in the newly diagnosed space. I think um, the results have been unprecedented, be they from uh, studies such as IMROS, which was the combination of RVD plus isotuximab, the really striking data from Perseus, RVD plus daratumab in transplant eligible patients who were transplanted, building on the success of the Griffin study, uh, which was a privilege to be part of um, with the overall leadership of Dr. Peter Voorhees. And what we were able to show in Griffin was very much mirrored by what was then seen by the Perseus study. So I think daratumumab-based approaches as part of quadruplets up front are um, clearly here to stay. And at the same time, we obviously have the impending data from Cepheus to, to, uh, to look at coming very soon. But we see, obviously, the power of the isotuximab-based platforms as well in the form of MROS and the high-risk studies that have been done by a variety of groups. So real excitement around the use of quadruplet therapies up front, both in transplant-eligible and transplant-ineligible patients. Of course, once that first line of treatment fails, then the question for the patient is, what do we do next? And as we think about that, fortunately, the vast majority of patients have sustained benefit to quadruplet therapy. The best example so far being that of IMROS with RVD um, isotuximab, where the median PFS estimates are remarkable at between 80 and 90 months. That being said, what happens, and, and of course that's without transplant. So uh, that being said, when relapse occurs after CD38 treatment, what do we do? Well, I think it depends on a few things. I mean, first of all, I think if a patient, say for example, is on daratumumab up front, and is on a maintenance schedule of daratumumab once a month when relapse occurs, that's a different situation than a patient who is primarily refractory to daratumumab-based therapy at an active dose schedule, such as twice a month or even, heaven forbid, weekly. Um, so I think that distinction needs to be borne in mind. Obviously, reaching for a BCMA-based strategy does make sense. This is obviously now, you know, thinking of CAR-T for the eligible younger, fitter patient, um, with the approval of Ida cell and Silta cell, and of course, lots of exciting research platforms as well. And of course, the real revolutionary advances from the biospecifics, first with teclistamab and obviously now with alronatinab, and with other approvals imminent, such as with Limvo. So I think putting these all together, um, biospecific opportunities are very attractive to consider for patients relapsing after quadruplet therapy. Obviously, we have to be a little careful because the label currently does not reflect first-line relapse, um, and obviously clinical trials in that regard can be very helpful. Um, that is not, of course, the case for Siltacel, where with the success of the uh, with the um, Carditude uh, 4 study, um, we have um, the approval for the use of Siltacel um, in, uh, in first relapse after first-line therapy. So I think there is an opportunity to think about Siltacel early now, whereas, of course, there wasn't in the approved and indicated setting uh, for standard of care. So these are kind of important things to think about. Now, what about patients who might not be candidates either for biospecifics or CAR-T? Well, that's a significant number of patients, recognizing that the median age of myeloma is around 70, so we have a substantial population of frailer older folks who need careful attention. Well, I think in that regard, there are obviously uh, a number of options, and these would revolve around chemotherapy-based strategies, be they with, for example, the combination of cyclophosphamide-based platforms in the United States, um, be they XUS uh, in the um, European setting, the ability to use um, melflufen, which obviously is approved um, for relapsed patients who have a very non-toxic platform for delivering uh, a, an alkylator warhead. Um, and then, of course, one needs to think about pomalidomide-based strategies, which arguably would be even more attractive in the setting, particularly of younger, fitter patients and even older patients, recognizing some of the more recent data that suggested that pomalidomide benefit may be a little more limited in older patients for a variety of reasons. That being said, clearly POM-based platforms or pomalidomide-based platforms, I think, are very important to consider. And there, there is, of course, the combination of pomalidomide and elotuzumab, 
um, which can be used very successfully um, in combination um, for patients in whom CD38 failure has occurred. I do also want to stress the value of cell and XOR based platforms, which are also important to bear in mind with the success of the Boston trial in the randomized setting, showing benefit to that approach. Um, this is always not necessarily an easy oral approach to, for patients to tolerate, but with lower dosing once a week and a proactive approach uh, to supportive care, not only is selenox so exquisitely active, especially in combination with the proteasome inhibitor and indeed pomalidomide, but it's also uh, relatively well tolerated as long as one's comfortable with uh, the supportive care strategies. And again, I think we've made substantial advances in that regard. Now, I think when we think about the uh, value of these approaches in older patients in whom, for example, a um, three-drug regimen such as Maya or based on the Maya regimen such as RD Dara has been used in a frailer elder, older patient. I think the obvious consideration there is that their proteasome inhibitor naive. And I would think strongly in terms of the use of bortezomib in the appropriate patient. Ixazomib with pomalidomide is another important combination to bear in mind for the frail and elderly because it's well tolerated. It's all oral, very low infectious rates and active, as we've shown both in uh, the Alliance study, um, which was published relatively recently, and in our own work with um, exacerbated and pomalidomide with a twice a week schedule of exacerbated machines seen striking activity. So there are some very important thoughts around that. And of course, the use of pomalidomide, bortezomib and dexamethasone, as exemplified by the results of the optimism trial, I think, um, are an attractive option after daratumumab has failed a patient um, and especially in the triplet setting. One other key area to touch on is the use of carfilzomib-based platforms in patients in whom, for example, they may have received RVD-DARA or, for that matter, RVD-ISA, and therefore are carfilzomib-naive. Now, we must recognize that carfilzomib is often used upfront in younger, fitter patients, appropriately so as such a potent proteasome inhibitor, and especially if it's not a risk to them from a cardiovascular standpoint. Um, that being said, when patients have had RVD DARA, for example, and their disease progresses, um, I personally love to reach for carfilzomib in combination with cyclophosphamide, for example, carfilzomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone. Another very attractive platform is carfilzomib, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone. And our own group has been using um, carfilzomib-based platforms with POM and appropriately um, adding an antibody of choice to that platform, depending on the scenario. So I think that... Um, all told, these approaches are numerous as we think about daratumumab failure when it fails a patient in the upfront setting. That's the very good news. I think the BCMA approach is particularly attractive, and by the same token, so is GPRC5D. Um, and so I think we have a, a wealth of choices. Um, but I think it's also important to remind people that when a quadruplet fails, um, the biology of that disease may be quite challenging. And so I think we have to be very creative and obviously clinical trials can be very uh, important in that setting.